I'd invite you to get your Bibles out and turn to the book of Luke. I'm sorry, the book of John. The book of John. John chapter 1. I've got a very limited time today to try to get across a point that's going to kind of set us up for the rest of the weeks leading up to Christmas morning. And this morning the title of my message is God is here. God is here. And you could put a subtitle underneath that and say, and he's brought some gifts with him. God is here and he's brought some gifts with him. And I want to focus on that for a little while this holiday season because as you all know that a good gift or really any gift for that, for that matter demands attention. Right? You start thinking about your birthdays, you start thinking about Christmas, and, and you want to wrap a gift, and particularly if it's a good gift, it demands attention, right? And, and you know what that looks like. If you've got a child who has ever gotten a favorite present, have you ever seen that experience? That child gets excited beyond uh, what's sane for a lot of us. And when you get that present, and we can relate because we've all gotten good gifts. And when you get a good gift, you do something about it, right? It demands our attention. And one, you use it. You get it. If it's a toy and you appreciate it, you play with it, right? And then if it's a gift card, you take it and you go and you get what you want. But, but, but the idea is when it's a good gift, it demands attention. And, and sometimes it's thanking the individual who got you the gift, and it's not just playing with it, right? You thank that person who's, who, who went out of their way in that thoughtful gesture and they gave you what it is that you so enjoyed and you've got to thank them. Now, for a lot of us, we also think it means that we've got to buy them one back, right? When you get a gift, and now how many of you do this with Christmas cards, right? It, it's Christmas card season and, and you think you want to get away from doing Christmas cards because it takes so much time, so much attention, and then you get a card from somebody else, you think, oh boy, I'll send one at least to them, Right? Or you send out 200 of them and you get one from the one you forgot. And they make the list. And hopefully you got enough time to get one out this year. If not, they make the list for next year. Because that's the way we're built. We're designed to respond to what others do for us. And what I want to look at for just a little while or for the next several weeks in reality as we go through this season is, is, is God is here. This is what Christmas is all about. Christ, God in the flesh. He came. And not only did he come, but he's brought some gifts. And I don't know that we fully always understand what those gifts are or how we should respond to those gifts. Not only how, but what is the reality and what do we actually do. Sometimes we know what we ought to do and we don't do it. But as we think about the Christmas season, I want to kind of... Uh, shred away or, or just kind of remove for a moment all of the fluff, right? When we start talking about the Christmas story, and we get this because Matthew and Luke, we, that's where we typically go for the Christmas account, right? But can you imagine, and as we tell the Christmas story, we always have got to talk about the angels that are involved. And we talk about Joseph, and we talk about Mary, and we talk about Bethlehem. And then there's the stars, and there's the wise men, and there's the shepherds, and, 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 and there's the census, and there's the inn, right? And there's no room at the inn. And, and we have all these elements that have made the Christmas story so special. And all those things are special, but I want to talk for just a moment. What would be the Christmas story without any of those things? What if we take away Bethlehem? What if we take away Joseph? What if we remove Mary? What if we, what if we take away the inn? And what if we remove the star? And what if there are no wise men and there's no shepherds? What if there is no manger? What if there is no stable? What if there is no baby? And for just a moment, I want to kind of strip those layers back. And, and, and is there such a possibility? Well, I believe that there is. And I believe that John captures this absolutely perfectly in his account of the Christmas story. So how do you tell that Christmas story without all of those things, all of those elements? And John, as we come to John chapter 1, I want you to look very first and foremost at verse 14. The Word became flesh. <clears throat> And what we typically would use countless of hours and sermons to, 
to come up with ideas behind all the angels and all the shepherds and all the other all the other fluff. Here comes John, and in a moment of masterful writing in four words, gives us the entirety of the Christmas message. The word became flesh. And so what we have is we have John approaching this from a theological perspective. And he's removing all of the other material elements of it. He's removing all the historical elements. And and he says the word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. And he goes on and he says, We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we see that the Word became flesh, the Logos. You say, well, why on earth use that kind of phrase? Why, why the Word? Why would he use that as a title? It's actually a very profound concept. And the fact that he does not explain why he used that Word indicates that the people to whom he was writing would have been very familiar with what he is trying to say. And it's absolutely masterful, it's powerful, it's so poignant, it's so to the point that there's nothing else he could have said to capture the attention of everybody around him the way he does with those four simple words. You see, to the Greeks or to the Gentiles, they knew logos as some kind of uh, 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 intrinsic or, or some kind of unknowable intelligence, some kind of abstract intelligence, so to speak. And it would have been credited to the force that is responsible for creation as we know it. You see, they served a whole pantheon. I mean, they, there's, they had a God for anything and everything. But above all that, they had this logos. They had this idea. Today, we would know it as agnosticism. Right? You're either Christian, you're an atheist, or, or there's some power out there. But we can't know what it is. And so we'd say we're agnostic. Well, this is what this would have been to the Greeks or to the Gentiles. The logos was that... That force that's responsible, that life force, so to speak, that is responsible for everything that we see. And it's not personal, and there's no way you can absolutely ever know it, but, but it's somehow so much bigger than us. That is why we are all here. And so that logos, and that's a Greek word, by the way, for word. Logos is the Greek word. And, and so they would have known the logos to be that power, that entity, that force that is responsible for you and for me and for all the creation the way we see it all around us. And so here comes... Here comes John in a very powerful way, and he says, you know what? The Logos is not some impersonable, unknowable force that is out there. The Logos is here. The Word has come, and it is flesh. And it is something that you can know. And it's something that you can, at least to some degree, wrap your mind around. And so, so to, the, to the Jew, or, to the, or not to the Gen- Jew, to the Gentile or to the Greeks, this would have been very well known. To the Jew, this would have been very powerful also. Because we look in the Old Testament, and what do we see constantly in the Old Testament? We see the Word of God. Right? The Word of God says, the Word of God came, the Word of God. And so God would send his prophets, or he'd speak through bushes, or however, dreams. And all the prophets would know and say, I've got a word from God. And so as you look through the Old Testament, the Jew would understand that the word was the way that God would reveal himself to his creation. The word of God was the way that God could make himself known. It was that manifestation or that revelation of who he was and what his character is and what he desires for you and for me. And here comes John and he says, the word of God is here. You talk about a manifestation of what God wants. No longer is he sending prophets to tell my people what I want them to know. I am coming in the flesh. And here's the ultimate manifestation, revelation of God. And so we have the perfect phrase to capture the attention of everybody around. And I won't want you to get confused by that word became. In the Greek, that's ginomai, and it means becoming. So a lot of people look at this and say, oh, well, he's he kind of becoming God. That's not what this is saying. And we'll look at that in just a moment. He's always been God, but this is God coming, invading time and space. God is eternal. Time is created. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But here comes God. It is not Jesus becoming God or anything of that nature. He's not coming into existence for the first time ever. He's just becoming a man for the first time ever. The incarnation. To help us understand that word a little bit better, we go back to the beginning of this chapter, to verse 1. 
And in verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So you see, in the beginning, that reflects a perfect parallel to Genesis chapter 1. The first few words that we see in all the Bible, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And here it says, in the beginning was the Word, right? We talk about what the Word is. This is the manifestation of God in flesh. And it says that the Word was with God and the Word was God. And so in other words, before all things, before all created, what was the beginning? It's the beginning of time. The beginning of space, the beginning of matter, the beginning of everything the way we know it. Here is a statement you could never possibly fully wrap your mind around. Before this development of time and space, the Word was. And the Word was with God. And so we see from the very beginning this idea of the Trinity. Because this phrase shows distinction between the two, but yet separate. You cannot say that in the beginning he was God the Father. We clearly see that is not possible. So he's not just simply with God, but it also says that he was God. See, in the Greek, I like the way the Greek puts this together. Because in the Greek language, you put the important part first, and then the rest follows. And in the Greek it's written, God was the Word. So what this is doing is taking this person that came in the flesh and trying very, very hard to get you to understand the profoundness of what has just taken place. We talked about a moment ago, you will witness a miracle. What was the miracle or what was the sign a virgin will conceive? Well, this is not just any normal baby the way you and I would understand, but this is God, the one who existed before time and space. He has come. He was here before everything else. And we kind of see that um, teased out a little bit in verses 3 through 5. And it says, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Verse 4, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So here he was in the beginning and in him was life and nothing was created without him being a part of that creation. So you cannot look at Christ and say he was a part of the creation of God. Now he was with God, and it says actually it was through him. See, we read the creation account, and we always picture God, God the Father, right? We go back to Genesis chapter 1. We don't even know about Jesus Christ yet. All we know is God the Father, but this ain't there. God was Son, was in his presence. He was there. In fact, it was through him that everything was made, because in him and through him is life. And then it says... That life, and equates it with light, and the light of all mankind says the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And what is the darkness? Well, what does that mean? It means the world of man. It means this place where Satan has his dominion, the prince of darkness, so to speak. And I love the way it says, because he came into this world. as the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And in fact, it's saying that the darkness cannot overcome it. I love that illustration. Have you ever seen darkness overcome light? It's virtually impossible. And it doesn't matter how small the flame. If it is burning, the darkness cannot overcome. And what a great picture because Christ came as a light in the midst of all the darkness. And try as the darkness might, it was not able to overcome what had taken place. And so we see many, many different attempts. And you can deny this truth all you want. You can, you can deny or reject or avoid the light all you want. But the fact is you will never be able to fully extinguish the light. I don't have time to dwell on it, but verses 6 through 8. And it kind of helps us understand why, because verses 6 or 8 talk about how God sent somebody to be an announcer of this light that was to come. And it's talking about John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist was here to prepare the way, so to speak. And in other words, the light is coming. You better get ready. Why should you get ready? Because if you're not ready, it's going to come and you're going to miss it. And we look at that and we kind of scratch our heads like, that. that's kind of weird because do you really need to announce light? Right? If I had a flashlight up here today, I could shine it out. No, you'd have to announce what I'm doing. Everybody would be able to see the light, right? Why, why do you have to announce it? Well, if you're blind, you don't see it. And that's the implication. Christ is coming into a world of darkness. 
And not only evil, not only darkness, but a bunch of people who are blind to the truth, to the reality that was about to come. And so John the Baptist was sent as a forerunner to Christ, trying to get people to be ready and to prepare the hearts for the one that would come, but they were blind. And as we come to verse 9, and this is just so powerful. I wish I had a little more time with you this morning. Verse 9 says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. You know, everybody looks at Christianity and says, oh, you're so exclusive of everybody else. It's your way or the highway kind of, well, this is the most inclusive thing that could ever be because here came the light and the light came as the true light, came as truth for everyone. For everyone. And so darkness can't stop it. Why? Because we talked about it this morning with the candle. God promised a long time ago that he was going to come. And so here he is. Right? Ta-da. I'm here. And there's nothing you're going to do to stop it. And, and it's truth and it's light to everybody who chooses to be a part of it. But then he comes to a very sad portion of the scripture in verse 10. He was in the world. Who's the he? It's Christ. It's the light. Right? And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Here's the one who is responsible. We say, oh, yes, he's born in Bethlehem. He's responsible for Bethlehem even existing. He is the source of all life, all of creation. Everything was done in and through him. And he came into the world which was made through him, as it says. And it says the world did not even recognize him. Can you imagine the heartache? Have you ever been around that person who's, who gets into Alzheimer's, who, or, or who has the issue with memory? And how difficult it is to go into somebody who you've had a relationship or whom you've loved and have done so much for and they don't even recognize you? That's tough from our perspective, but we look at this master plan that God has put together and all the sacrifice that Christ came, leaving heaven and coming and, and being crucified on a cross so that we could have that relationship his very own creation says they didn't even recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own and did not receive him. And we look at that and say, well, how terrible. But we got to understand, remember, this is easy to do. We, we, we even do this, even as believers, even as people who recognize all that Christ is, we can sometimes fail to recognize. I mean, just think the Christmas has passed for just a moment. And I'll be the first to raise my hand that there's sometimes a whole Christmas season can come and go and I probably fail to recognize Christ the way I ought to. Why? Because life gets busy. We talked about this last year. Remember I, I told you don't replace the miracle with the madness was kind of that thought concept last year because it gets that way. Our society is that way and it will suck us in with all the things that we are supposed to do and if we're not careful we can go through a whole Christmas season and never recognize the Christ that it is all about. Why? Because we got all the decorations and we got the presents and all the attention is on me, 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 me. But you got to ask the question, why did they miss it? Why did they not recognize it? This isn't talking about believers who kind of miss it when they get too busy. But his own did not recognize him. And not only did they not recognize him, they did not receive him. And we say, why? Here's a simple reality. They chose not to. They chose not to. Because if this is truth, and we know that it is, because he is the truth, the true light. He came in grace and truth, right? If all those things are true, then that means I am accountable to somebody outside of myself, and I just can't handle that. If this is true, then I answer to somebody else instead of answering to myself, and I can't handle that. If this is true, that's light, and I don't like the light. Why? Because I'm evil. I like evil. If you fast forward just a couple chapters and go to John chapter 3, in verse 18, it says that Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, but those who don't believe are condemned already. And it goes on, here's the verdict. The light was sent, but they chose to reject the light. And why did they reject the light? Because they loved the darkness. Darkness hides the evil. We know that to be truth and reality, right? Most crimes happen in the dark. Why? Because when light comes, it, it sheds light on what you're doing. It sheds light on those deeds. And so those who love the darkness, those who love evil, stay away from the light. These are most active at nighttime. So that's why they didn't recognize him. They chose 
to not recognize. And here's what I want you to see, okay? God is here. And he's brought some gifts with him. And this is the very first one I want you to see. Verse 12, very quickly. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. I almost got to the point where we spent the next three weeks on that one verse. Because this is absolutely incredible. Yet to those who did receive. And how did they receive? Through believing. Believing how? Believing in his name. That is not simply to mean that you believed that this man's name was Jesus. Like I believe that's Jim. No, to believe in his name means to believe in all of who he is. It's not enough to know his name was Jesus. In fact, there is not, everybody in history, at least to this point, who are honest with themselves, recognize that Jesus existed. He was a real historic figure. And they believe his name was Jesus. In fact, there's no reputable scholar out there anymore who will deny that Jesus Christ ever existed. Because there's too much evidence for him. But it's not enough simply to believe that he exists and that his name is Jesus. It means those who believe in his name and all that he is and all that he has done. That means you believe that he was God. That he came. That he did die. And the sacrifice was for you. And it was for me. And now he sits at the right hand of God. And he's up there on our behalf. And he's preparing a place for you and a place for me. And if we surrender and live our lives the best that we can for him. He's going to come back and he's going to take us home one day. And I like what this says. Yet to all who believed in that, he gave the right to become the children of God. Your translation might say he gave them the power to become the children of God. And what I like, you see, normally we talk about power and we talk about the Greek word for power. And most times we talk about dunamis. Right? That that, that power, that explosive power. We get our word dynamite from it. But this is not that Greek word. This is not dunamis. This is exousia. This, this, is, this is a word that means delegated authority. I like that. For anybody who believes, this is not a dunamis power. This is an authoritative power. He gave the right to become children of God. It is now within your authority. It is now your prerogative. And so I love this passage. God became man that we might become children of God and what I want you to see this very first gift that he brings with him is that of adoption that's a powerful thing we've talked about adoption in the past such a powerful powerful thing this idea this concept of adoption and you can even write their salvation if you want to because that's the reality of what it's saying But you have the authority to become children. Based on what authority? The authority of God says this sacrifice is enough. And if you're willing to believe in that, in his name, and all that he is, you now have the authority to become a child of God, to enter into that adoption. And I love the picture of adoption because it's pulling you out of one system and bringing you into another. New authority, new freedoms, new liberties, no longer a slave to the old. Salvation frees us from all that was in the past, all the ugly, all the death, all the sin, all the darkness, all the evil that we just talked about in this passage. And then you exercise the authority of that new governing body. See, as a son of Robert Snyder, I share in all the blessings that come with that and all that he had established and all that he had done. And here we have that same authority, but God is so much bigger and so much more infinite. So God is here. And he came to express himself in a way that he never had before. This is not, here's a word from God. This is not, there's some unknowable force out there that is responsible for our existence and our creation. Not some abstract nothingness that so many other people tend to cling to. But he came and he brought these gifts with him. And in the incarnation brought first and foremost that gift of adoption or that gift of salvation. And that's the point I want you to catch this morning. Because we said at the very beginning, good gifts cannot be ignored. What a great gift. What a great gift. If you have ever been through the adoption process, the gratitude that comes from that, all that has been done, you you don't ignore that kind of a thing. And so... 
here's what I want you to do. I want you to, by point of application, I don't necessarily want you to fill this out right now. In return, I will give. I want you to chew on this for a little bit. Because God is here and he's brought some gifts and a great gift cannot be ignored. So in light of what God has done and what Christ has brought to you, and we're going to talk the next couple of weeks about some of these other gifts that he brought. And while we're in the midst of the season where all our time and attention is focused on what gifts we're going to give to everybody else, all of our time and attention is focused on what can I ask for and what will I receive this Christmas season, I want your attention to focus. I mean, after all, this is the birth of Christ. This is not your birthday. Right? And so the idea is I want you to start thinking about what you can offer up as a gift in return. And I want you to chew on that for a little while. And it can be something that's positive or it can be something that is negative. And here's what we're going to do. We have service on Christmas morning. I know that's going to eliminate a lot of you because of previous plans. I get that. But 9 o'clock Christmas morning, we're going to gather in this place. And at that time, we're going to go through some commitments. Out there in the pews will be some ornaments, so to speak. This tree is going to come out here, and it will be front and center. And as an individual or as a family, you're going to write down what it is that you're going to offer up to God. And on Christmas morning, you're going to put it on that tree, symbolizing the gift that you're going to give in return for all that God has given you. And it might be more time. Right? I'm too busy. I get lost in too many things. Uh, not just more time for myself, but maybe more time for family. Maybe it's ministry. Maybe, maybe God has been calling me to do something in ministry, and I've been avoiding doing that particular thing. Maybe I'm going to read my Bible more. Maybe I'm going to memorize more Scripture. See, it can be something positive, but I want you to understand it can be something negative as well. And maybe on Christmas morning you come and you write on that thing, and you're going to say, I'm going to give to God all my worry this year. I don't want to deal with that because one of the gifts that he brought is eliminating worry because we don't have to deal with that. He's already dealt with all that. And maybe I'm going to offer up my worry. Maybe I'm going to offer up that addiction, whatever it might be, that bad habit, whatever it might be. And I'm going to offer that up as a gift for God saying thank you for all that he has done for me. Maybe it'll be that relationship. You know, I'm not talking about your marriage unless it's a good thing. You're going to get that and you're going to work on God. But maybe, maybe you've got a relationship that needs to be done away with. You know, that toxic individual that you're always around. And, and more times than not, this is teens or maybe it's somebody in the workplace. Maybe that, that person that just, they're always bringing you down or is making you do something you know you ought not to do. But the idea is simply this. In return, I will do this. Because here's the idea. God is here and he's brought some gifts. And great gifts demand our attention. And so what am I going to do in return? And that very first gift we already talked about, if nothing else, salvation ought to do it. The fact that you get to spend eternity in heaven with your Savior with your maker ought to be enough in and of itself to say and, and maybe you already know and that's fine but you don't get to put it on a cre tree until Christmas morning and if you can't be here Christmas morning that's okay too you can still make these commitments but I just want you to be intentional with what you do stand with me Roger's going to come and lead us in a song Emmanuel And if the Lord has spoken to your heart in any way at all this morning, I encourage you to respond to that. And it can be where you stand. You can come pray if you want to come pray. I'll pray with you if you want to pray. I'll leave you alone if you want to be left alone. But however the Lord has spoken to your heart and mind this morning, respond as we sing the song together. Father, we thank you for this day once again. We thank you for the promise that was made so many thousands of years ago for you to send your son. And Father, as he came, as you came, as you entered into time and space, we take a moment to recognize that you brought many gifts with you. The first of which is that gift of salvation. And this morning we say thank you for the sacrifice that was made to make that possible. We thank you that you stand firm to your promises. Father, help us to remember that as we go forward from this place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.